You're listening to the Write Project Podcast and Radio Program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. Welcome to a very special episode of the Write Project Podcast. Today, we've got a host of authors on to answer one of the most frequent questions that's asked of any author. We're asking them, what is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry? And today to answer, we have on Jamie Thomas, the author of Asperfell, a gothic fantasy YA adult crossover novel novel that Publishers Weekly said had tremendous crossover appeal. What is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry? Oh, oh goodness. Um, okay. <laughs> Hopefully this will not be um, very controversial. It probably will be. Um, as you know, back a few years ago, we had a big scandal in American publishing where it was discovered that um, quite a few uh, famous or well-known male authors were leveraging their uh, positions and experience in order to exploit and um provide or uh, for sexual advances upon younger uh up-and-coming female novelists i didn't know that but somehow i'm not surprised and that's probably yeah, the worst you know, thing I'm not, yeah uh it, it's you know and um and this happens in every industry it seems um honestly but um this idea of leveraging power because you have these up-and-coming writers who are so desperate to break into this industry um and uh people that um they maybe look up to or feel like they can't um refuse or or you worry about your reputation or whatever um but i am still seething about that years later um yeah. i'm a i'm a pretty hardcore feminist if you've read Asperfell, um Yes. Uh, and so for me, I think it is just, it's publishing is very male dominated still. Um, and this idea of um, exploiting a position uh, of power over somebody who does not have that power um, is just, that is my uh, just mm, getting all seethed just talking about it but that is my biggest uh uh, beef with uh the american publishing industry right now we also have um well and you might know about this uh right now happening with this um big online library that is being provided as an emergency for don't um, get me started oh yes Um, actually get me started but yeah i'm very upset about this yes and so um this idea of um, writers being, what did they call them? Um, idea landlords, idea landlords. And that, uh, that we should be totally fine with our work being put on this library, this emergency digital library, um, without being compensated. And, um, basically the idea of, of piracy, um, because some people, uh, I think, incorrectly assume that when a library purchases your or, or gets a hold of your book, that they don't pay for it, which is absolutely untrue. No, I, um, but a good chunk of <laughs> if you're a small yes. publisher, a good chunk of your sales that lets you get off your feet are from local libraries. Libraries, yes, and so people check out those books from those libraries, but the artist still gets. Uh, paid from that. And when a and library, so, a legitimate library, holds your ebook, if you've ever had that, you yep. get paid mm-hmm. a very small amount, but every time it's checked out, you, you get a small, like, bit. Yes. Yes. And so this, um, this has just come up, obviously, in the last couple of weeks. And um, so this idea that, that us writers are idea landlords, and, and they're saying, well, um, just go get a real job or um, I shouldn't have to pay you for your ideas. And it's, it's like, oh my goodness, you're not paying me for my ideas. You're paying me for the blood, sweat, and tears and the work I put in making those ideas into something you can read. No, but my, my um, answer to that is also, it's not like I'm making you buy it. 
Like, you don't have right, to pay exactly. me for my ideas, but you do if you <laughs> want them. Yes, exactly. Like, Go find somebody else's ideas if you don't you know, want to pay for mine. But um, I think this idea of writers not being a legitimate um career oh get a you know go get a real job you just write books it's a hobby a lot of people think of of it as a hobby and um and so that those two things have sort of kind of ground my gears i could go on forever but i won't um you know but uh though i'd say those two things are the things most on my mind right now i I got in a sordid Twitter war with uh, someone up here who I'm not, I won't name because he's litigious. He or she is litigious, but he runs a torrenting site Uh, to the point that like there's a, for some reason uh, up here, there is an independent like political party up. It's the Canadian system is different than the American one. And any old person like group can just pop up and say like, I'm a political party too. They don't get oh. votes, so it doesn't last mm-hmm. long, but, you know. Yes. Uh, he led a privacy per a piracy party. Oh, like, my gosh. A political party that that whole their whole platform was piracy is the correct and right way to do things. Oh, wow. And, I'm flabbergasted, but not at the same time. Yes, uh, <laughs> but anyway, like I like I found a bunch of uh, me and my colleagues' books online, oh, and no. had and, and on on this piracy site, oh, no. and had gone and went and see, the thing is because he views it as like this right thing, he's not hiding. Like the site is registered under his real name oh, and his boy. real Twitter, so people went after him for legal action, but he just kind but, of. Yeah sues back or takes the book down but doesn't really take it down you know what i mean and like oh, okay. deflects yeah. mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that yeah. um and, and if all the people who like his site because they like getting stealing books all stealing st- books for free <laughs> yes and started like jumping on me on twitter to the point where it became oh. exhausting and i just had to delete all the tweets and like yes. block the people but like I couldn't get over the dissonance because the same human, like, this wasn't different humans, like, the same (laughs) human would argue at the same time that, like, I'm so tiny, my books probably aren't in print anyway, what do I care, I'm probably only losing 13 cents because nobody wants to read my books. Oh, wow. And then later in the same thread, that human would argue that I'm a big wig writer who wants all the money and is ideal and being an idea <laughs> landlord and like I can't like I'm oh basically God. a one percenter that's sitting on my big pile of money. And I'm like <laughs> which way would you like what? it? Because you can't yeah, have it both you ways. You can't have it both ways. Oh my goodness. Isn't Twitter a cesspool? I mean I, I've made some wonderful connections and have some great friends and there are some wonderful writers and a community of writers on there. But Oh, Twitter can be such a hot mess, such a dumpster fire sometimes. If Twitter <laughs> ended tomorrow, I wouldn't be sad ever. <laughs> oh, goodness. Like, it, I wouldn't ever be like, oh, you know what I miss? Twitter. Like, Twitter. I miss ICQ. <laughs> I miss that little that little flower with the thing. Did Was that everywhere or was that just a Canada thing? I think that's a Canada thing. Yeah, this little, like, original Dawn of the Internet chat program kind of thing. I miss stuff like that. I would never miss Twitter. Twitter. Mm. I would never be like, you know what I'm nostalgic for? Horrible people on the Internet (laughs) that treat other humans like garbage. Yes, trolls. I miss trolls. Let's have more trolls. I'm a troll, but I'm not that kind of troll. Like, Well, are you the kind that lives under the bridge and... You can't pass unless we solve your riddles. No, I'm. I'm. Like that, I'm kind of okay. I'm. I'm the type who, when I had roommates, would like replace their salt with sugar and their sugar with salt. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Not, not maybe in your roommate's opinion, but yeah. I mean, they'd get me back, you know. <laughs> oh, sure, of course, of course. Like I had this one roommate who I just pranked constantly. He's actually uh, uh, another writer. Uh, his name is Matthew Daniels. Um, we lived together for a while. He's a great guy. Uh, we had this back and forth. I pranked him constantly with mean, uh, like, like spiteful pranks to ruin his life. And he got my, and he got me back 
by being a polite, well-mannered individual that never did anything wrong. So, a Canadian, basically, Yeah, right? so tit for tat. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right. Okie dokie. Um, good answer and long tangent. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Chelsea B., author of London Calling and Christmas Mornings. What is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry? One of them would definitely be not supporting each other, I think, is a big one. And one that unfortunately is fairly common because I've and I've had discussions with writers because I have, you know, very close friends who are writers. And you know, the people who I'm friends with are the ones who agree with me on this. But I don't feel no competition between myself and even someone who writes in my same genre. You mean writers who treat it like a zero-sum game, where it's like, oh, if they're buying someone else, then they're not buying me. I was like, no, readers buy everything. Yes. One of my close friends is Kate Robbins, who writes romance set in Scotland, so very close to my romance set in London. And we've had many, many good discussions about writing and publishing and everything, and she's... She has a different publisher than me. She's been writing for a lot longer than me. You know, we're in theory competition, but we feel absolutely no competition because... You're not in her league? No. (laughs) (laughs) We feel no competition because someone who, you know, has bought and read all of her books are only looking for more in that genre. You know, they don't solely read one author. If you do, then it's probably not the market that I'm looking for anyway. There. Right. So I think that feeling competition and talking down on other people in the same writing industry, I think, puts a bad name on yourself more than anything else. And it won't drive sales. Definitely That's not. Thank you very much. Next up, we have the author of Alligator and February, Lisa Moore. Lisa Moore, what is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry right now? Wow. Um, let's see. Unethical practice in the publishing industry. Um, It's not that I want to pass on the tough question, but I honestly, I mean, I guess I would have to say that big box stores, big book box stores often would order uh, a large number of books to make sure that uh, uh, independent bookstores wouldn't be able to uh, access those books and have them on their shelves while the books were in the limelight of being uh, reviewed and, you know, when the promotion was going on and when uh, the publicity was doing all its work to bring that book to the foreground uh, it, just as it had been published. And then when that moment died and, and when that all of that energy that had gone into uh, making the book, making people aware of the book, and when they were no longer looking for that particular book, uh, the big box stores would send the books back to oh. the publishers. I would say that's probably the most unethical thing that I can think of at the moment. What yeah. struck me as deeply unfair to independent bookstores. And... and- the publishers and authors too because you're sending those books back at the end and those yeah that comes at a profit that's uh yeah that's a huge problem i didn't i that that one i wasn't even aware of because that's kind of above my level but yeah that's crazy i don't know if that's still happening because um i know that uh there's a resurgence of independent bookstores and um Yes, thankfully. And so I'm not sure if that's still what's happening. And of course, big box stores are diversifying and they're not just uh, selling books, which is another problem because um, it just means that the diversity of literature is winnowed down. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, so th- there have been a few quagmires with the big box stores, I think. I, I really despise big box stores, and I'll probably get myself in trouble for saying that, like the big book box stores, but like, I hate anything, I, what I love about indie bookstores, as much as like, when you get in one, you're only in that one, you know what I mean? Like, so you're not in 30 across the country, 
But when you do go there, you can just go and meet the person, talk with them, and ask, hey, can I put my book on your shelf, and, and I'll give you this much of the cover, and, you know, maybe we can do a sign or something. That's lovely, and it's easy. The bureaucracy of, like, you have to email someone in Toronto or in the States if you want to get in this huge store it just drives me insane. Yes, for sure. Anyway, thank you, Lisa Moore, thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have author Shannon Green. Shannon Green is a gifted author with a talent for the strange and has been recognized in both the genre community and the contemporary literary community for his pursuits. In the past, he has been shortlisted for the 1996 Arts and Letters Award and has has well won the 2015 Audience Choice Steampunk Newfoundland Showcase. Green has received praise for his stories The Wine Dark Sea in Chillers from the Rock as well as his stories in Fantasy from the Rock Dystopia from the Rock, the Hamthology, and the just-released Flights from the Rock. Thank you for joining us, Shannon. What is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry? From what I've seen, it's the pay-to-publish, where they, the, the companies will trick you into thinking, oh, we're going to do everything for you, and you end up having to pay just for everything on your own, and the publishing company does nothing to help you out. I understand there's investment involved on both sides, but if a company is saying, yeah, we'll publish X number of books for Y number of dollars, that's not a publishing company, that's a printer. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is a huge that is, problem. That is, that's my problem. That's top why. number one <laughs> hatred thing in the industry right now. Absolutely. And it, it is a big problem because you think you're getting published. And if you go into it thinking, okay, I need to find a printer with your eyes open, great. Yeah. The printer can brand, charge, you charge based on their rates. But if you go in thinking, I've got a publisher and all their support is we need more money from you, that really isn't a publisher. That's, you know, that's the taxi driver who picks you up and expects you to drive the car and then pay him too. Yeah. Yeah, it, it yeah, is the, it the, is the, the, the tail wagging the dog, wagging for lack of a better dog, analogy. Better analogy. But, it, but it's also, it's also creates this huge problem where, where, like, like, yeah, the poor author yeah, that this happened to might not know, know the difference, know the but then they're but entering, entering the world of authors, and, like, you know, you're at an event or something like that, and you say, yeah, to anyone who knows the difference, and you're sitting there demanding to be treated like you're published like the rest of them, and they're like... Oh no no! <laughs> like you know what I mean? It, it's it's weird. It is, and it does create a weird divide where they think they're not big house published, but they think they're a published author, and really they're an indie author or which is a fine. Pub author. fine. Totally fine. Just know what you I are. Have no problem with those. Just like you said, know who you are. Know what side of this divide you're on. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Nicole Little. Nicole Little is an acclaimed short story author who has been featured in more than a half dozen titles just in the last year. She has been featured in Kitsora, the autobiography, best-selling Dystopia from the Rock, Flights from the Rock, Monsters, Beyond, and Apocalypse, Apocalypse, Eerie Christmas, Love, and Bad Romance. It's just a plethora of short story material. Currently, she is working on The Lotus Fountain, which is going to be one of the books included in, or novellas included in a big project from Engine Books that we can talk about now called Slipstreamers. Uh, Nicole Little, in your opinion, what is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry right now? Oh, my goodness. Well, I know I've seen a lot of stuff about um, companies that say they're going to uh, publish your uh, work, but then they require you to pay them. Vanity Press, disguising itself yes. as publisher, yeah. Yes, or like, um, and they're basically just printers who, you know, don't do any of the work. Basically, you're the one who's left, you know, doing all the marketing and um, the sales and stuff like that. And you end up paying them like a huge chunk of money. Yeah, I've seen quite a few things like that on uh, yeah on Twitter. People, you know, complaining about it and stuff like that. It's, it's a fleecing horrible. scam, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's that's very true. And while I mean, not to s set up the right, like when it comes to uh, marketing, a lot of times, like first time authors or even small press publishers. Uh, might not have the money for a lot, a lot of marketing. Like, it's pretty much become a thing where authors are, even bigger ones, uh, are kind of required to do a fair yes. chunk of marketing themselves. But it should all be stuff that doesn't cost the author yes, money. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like if there's ads that need to be paid for, that comes out of the publisher. If it's just making an appearance, yeah, yeah, you should probably do that if you're an author. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Cool, cool. Great answer. Yeah, that's that's really wretched in our industry right now, especially the yeah. amount like of ones that are kind of disguising themselves as publishers. Like if they called themselves printers or even vanity printers or whatever they want to call themselves, that's fine. But when you call yourself a publisher, it creates this false expectation of what a publisher is. Yeah, it's all this cloak and dagger stuff when there's no, like, me be more transparent about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my big go-to for it uh, is if you go on their website and you can easily find their submissions, that's not a publisher. Yeah. Because a publisher shouldn't be trying to sell you on getting your book published. A publisher should be trying to sell you books. Yes. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Tracy Waddleton, who is from Trapassi, Newfoundland. She recently just put out a book through Breakwater Books called Send More Tourists, The Last Ones Were Delicious. Tracy Waddleton, what is, is, in your mind, what is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry right now? The most unethical practice in the publishing industry... I would say it's maybe that the author doesn't get a great deal of the royalties from their own work. I agree. So it feels that's that's hard. And I, that's industry standard, and I know that. Um, so you're facing that with traditional publishing uh, no matter where you go, pretty much. Um, but it's hard, you know, because it's your, it's your life's work, and you, you put all this effort into creating something and then at the end of the day, I mean, you, you'd have to be a bestseller to make any kind of a living it, from your work when you're publishing with a traditional publisher, yeah. You really have to be a, a multi-bestseller. Like, I, I'll meet people who think, you know, you're a writer, you must be doing okay. And I just kind of smile and laugh and laugh. <laughs> but, like, even... Yeah, it's true. Like, when it comes to living off your book like if you had one bestseller not multiple bestsellers but one you might be able to live off that for a few years but not forever you know yeah i think i i remember reading prior to um her books being optioned for movies or, or hbo shows or well wherever the handmaid's tale is um that atwood was only making something like 30 grand a year on royalties and, I mean, that's Margaret Atwood, who's, like, one of the most prolific, if not the most prolific, Canadian writer. So yeah. if Margaret Atwood can only pull in 30000 on royalties from an entire life, like, life's worth of books, yeah. then, you know, what hope do we have, sort of thing? Um, so it's a, little, it's a little daunting to go traditional publishing when you think of, of those things. But, of course, there's opportunities to read and... Um, you know, do workshops and, and kind of travel around to festivals. And, and I think that's where writers make their their money. Absolutely. Good answer. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Kayla Krantz, who's calling in from Detroit. Uh, she's originally from Houston. She writes the Rituals of the Night series. What's the most unethical practice in the publishing industry, in your opinion? That most unethical. Um, I haven't really run across many people who do unethical things, but I have seen like a few writing scandals. I remember one. I don't remember the name of the author, but he would uh, put like offers for giveaways at the very end of his book to encourage his readers to flip to the end, which would get him Kindle Unlimited reads. Yep. And that's so goes against Amazon policies. That, that wasn't even, I mean, one guy was famous for it. I also can't remember his name, but uh, that, there was, that just became a bit of a weird book-stuffing practice. 
to the point where like yeah. you've got four books in your uh, in your Rituals of the Night series. What what some authors would do is they would put out say the fourth book and then put all three books in the back of the fourth book and then have uh, like you said a giveaway code at the very end. So even though it's only 200 pages of new material, people would have to scroll through a thousand pages to find the, the code, which is ridiculous. Yeah, and then the author gets paid for every page that they skip. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is just silly. That said, I love Kindle Unlimited. <laughs> yeah, I, I do too. It's actually wonderful. Yeah. Um, do you have it, by the way? Kindle, do you, you, do you read a lot of, uh, of indie stuff or, or Kindle Unlimited stuff or stuff like that? Because I, I know a lot of authors that don't. I actually do. I like Kindle Unlimited as both a reader and an author. I like to book, I like to review books on the side. So having Kindle Unlimited gives me the opportunity to check out a bunch of new authors and different works without having to crack into my budget for it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's only so much a month, isn't it? Is it, or is it? Do you have to pay it? it that that's right, right? Kindle Unlimited is only like so many dollars it's like a month. Nine like or Netflix. ten dollars a month. Yeah, so it's like Netflix for books. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Next up, we have. Tasha Madison, the author of Fabric of a Generation. Um, Tasha Madison, in your mind, uh, what is the most unethical practice in the publishing industry right now? Mm, I think it's a hard one. Um, I think, you know, probably the most unethical thing I can think of is, thankfully it's never happened to me, but I've, I've known some writers who um, I've known in the past who have had their work stolen. Oh, um, yeah. And especially, especially very early on in my career, before there was a lot of these protections in, in place, you know, especially before social media, before technology really had advanced, um, I've had some dear friends who have had the work stolen, um, really? and more than one. Yeah, um, and so, like I said, thankfully it's never happened to me, um, but yeah, it has happened. So Can I'll probably I say, ask, uh, stolen in what way? Because now it's easy. Like, if someone, but there's also safeguards against it. So, like, if someone took your ebook and was nefarious and was like, I know, twirls their mustache, I'm going to make some money. They could just, if they bought the PDF or like some other format like that, they can just copy it, paste it into their own and try to upload it and make money of it with a different title and author. You know what I mean? But, right. but uh, Amazon and a bunch of other sites have like algorithms that check against and make sure that the same text hasn't been uploaded before. And it's, it's flagged me, it never ends badly, but it's flagged me before re-uploading my own book, like a new edition or something like that, and they'll go... Right, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying nowadays, it's possible, but it's, I feel like it's a lot harder because of the technology. Yeah. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it, that wasn't really the case, you know, so I've had, you know, friends who have had their manuscripts taken, and I remember when one of my dear friends, this actually happened when I was in college, um, and I was working as a, actually a news reporter at the time. And when she told me, I was just kind of like in awe. I mean, I just thought, wow, really? You know, like that actually happens? Like you hear, because you hear stories about it. But it, I mean, it, I think it's kind of one of those things that you don't really think about until it happens to someone that you care about. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. So, so how would they, I'm, I'm not asking you for tips on how to steal manuscripts. So I'm like, how would they get it? Because now it's so easy to get someone's stuff and then copy it, but there's protection. So is it like... Yeah, but see, back then, it was sharing your manuscript, right? right. Um, and so she shared, uh, actually, her manuscript with someone at the time who she thought was her mentor. Oh, I gotcha. Um, and so it was during, really, the creation process, and I think that's how it ended up happening, um, and that's how it ended up being easy to happen. That'll and do her it. Mentor, her mentor said, this is great, and slapped her name on it, and because she was well-known in the industry, no one thought any up wiser, so... That is yeah. gross. Okay. I understand now. Uh, perf well, that's horrible, but okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.